because it's going to be a fun night. Tune in for Friday Night Fight Night. That's the tutorial until now. Feel free to ask more questions. The glasses that are supposed to make me look smart go off so that I can see again because they're yellow tinted. They're all right, but I don't, I no longer need them. We're going to go play a game live on the European server with a new account, Fight Night at Friday. Are you guys ready? So when you are a new Warcraft 3 player and you log in to the, uh, to the battle net, you can start what is called a ladder game. Here in the top left, you can see play game or quick play game. It will use the previous settings that you have. There's many different game modes in Warcraft 3. In fact, some of the game modes have spawned new genres. Has anyone here ever heard of Dota? or Dota 2, League of Legends. These games found their origins in StarCraft 1 and before that in Warcraft 3. Ah, uh, sorry, after that in Warcraft 3. Heroes of the Storm itself is based off of a genre that was popularized in Warcraft 3 and it's called Dota. Dota was a custom map created in the map editor of Warcraft 3 and it became immensely popular, more popular even than Warcraft 3 melee mode. But Warcraft 3 melee mode perseveres for the appreciator, the aficionado, nonetheless. Many of you here are here for Warcraft 3. So when you go to the custom game section up there, you can join a custom game and there's so many fun different game modes. Castle Fight, Enfos, Fight of Anime Season 3, Full Metal Alchemist, Farmer vs Hunter, Battle Ro Royale, Ship tag, stronghold, American colonization, <laughs> the war of racists. <laughs> and of course, I will show you some of my favorites as well. Um, yeah. Some of my favorites, Eastern Kingdoms 24, 24 player FFA, Pimp Ma Peon, uh, Footman Frenzy. And of course, uh, Diablo 3, Diablo Duel. You can actually play Diablo 3 within Warcraft 3. Uh, there's Run Kitty Run. And Uther Party is really, really fun as well. Green Tower Defense. Uh, Show Your Micros, the Micro War. Element TD, one of my favorite tower defense maps as well. Yeah. And um, let's see. Of course, there was also... Uh, Canned bread, really recommend it. NSFW, by the way. Snowball fight, dwarf race, escape from gay heaven, a true classic. Pudge wars, don't move to Tauren. Uh, the weakest link. A lot of cool maps, so you can host or join any of these. Uh, but ladder is what we'll be focusing on mostly because it comes closest to approximate what your Friday night fight night experience will look like when Insuperable is going up against Hunter for the $200 first place price. So if you're a new player, you go to the play game section, you choose whatever race you like. What race would you guys like to see for me to over explain and teach you in the general game flow? Human, Orc, Undead or Night Elf? Also, there are a few different maps. We can choose which ones to play. I will leave all up for now. I see a lot of undead. Let's go with undead. Whichever would be the easiest for a new player, someone said. Well, in that case, let's. that's actually a good point. Let's start with undead because the people have spoken and then we're gonna go to the race that might be easiest for a new player. But. I'm going to show you things that are easy to play for a new player, no matter what. You shouldn't deny yourself your favorite race just because you think it will be harder. There is a way to play each one. The first place price for Fight Night, Prostman Pat, is going to be $200. The loser will get $100.
as compensation for their time. All bits that are given during Friday fight night by the community will be spread out among production, 10%, players, 25% each, and 40% goes to a bounty. The bounty is granted when the challenger, the king of the hill, play. When the king of the hill stays, his own bounty grows, only to be collected when he walks away. But any challenger that beats the king of the hill in the Friday fight night, they will steal the bounty. But they won't get it until they walk away. We can see here, my race is undead. His race is undead as well. And we are going to be starting the game. The map is going to be Terrisful Glades. The first thing you do, take all your acolytes, put them on the gold mine. Train two new acolytes and send them to your gold mine. And then take your ghoul and send it to the lumber. Blizzard has done a great job at making every race unique. For this race, Undead, is the only one that has different workers for different resources. Acolytes on the gold mine and ghouls on the trees. Another cool new element of Undead is that the ghouls are also their primary fighting unit in the early stages of the game. So it's a worker that doubles as a fighter. Really cool idea. And Undead are unique in this. The first thing I've done is make sure my gold mine is full. And then I've made sure that my ghoul is mining lumber. Ghouls mine lumber more rapidly or more efficiently than other workers. But because they double up as army units, Undeads need to make difficult decisions whether they're going to use them for fights or whether they're going to use them for lumber mining. I have made a sixth acolyte. He can't mine gold any quicker, but this is because RTSs are games of imperfect information. Imperfect, but not none. Having no information is often deadly for the process of your gameplay. So it's good to make an extra worker and send it to the other side of the map. Now this is a two player map. You could see that when the game is starting or you could know it because you're more familiar with the map. On two player maps, he's going to be on the opposite side, right here at the bottom right. I'm going to send my worker over there to see what I can see. He was an undead. I want to see if he's going to which unit first. If his graveyard is finished, he is most likely going to be producing Cryptfians, an early ranged unit. They require a different approach than ghouls. However, he has no graveyard. He's got three ghouls. And thus I know that he, like me, is going for ghouls. My death knight finishes and my shop is ready. So I'm going to purchase a rod of necromancy. And then I'm going to go towards him. When the altar's torches are burning, it means that his hero is still in production. It just finished. He has created a dreadlord, which I saw with my scouting worker unit. I am going to let my worker unit die on the edge of his black land which is called blight i'm gonna go over there and summon skeletons with my rod of necromancy the dreadlord is a fearsome opponent he has an ability called sleep sleep temporarily puts my hero in a position where i can't move it i can't use abilities or anything if i get too near chances are he does a sleep on me and he then takes his hero and all of his units and he surrounds me leaving me no choice but to use my scroll of town portal to save my hero. That's something I do not want to have happen. So, I keep my hero away from his dreadlord. I am not committing heavily to the early game. I've only got three ghouls, so my goal is to buy as much time as I can by basically doing nothing but being on the edge. I'm gonna use one of my spells to steal. Oh, I failed to steal. Death Coil is an ability that deals 100 damage to creeps or enemy units. Throwing out the Death Coil on one of his creeps could mean that I could steal the experience and the gold that that creep provides. However, it was too late, so I didn't steal it. I'm continuing to be around here and I'm trying to make sure that he doesn't creep too fast. 
If he's wasting time, I'm happy, because I've actually gone to tier 2 very rapidly. I'm saving up crit fiends, ranged combat support creatures, at home. By not using them yet, I'm making it easy for myself to manage my time, to manage the game as a new player. So I'm just walking around with a hero. That unit is low. We are going to try and kill it. He has done the surround. I now need to make a decision to lose my hero, free myself, or use my town portal. I just freed myself and I'm trying to run away. I'm gonna use skeletons to prevent him from surrounding me again. And it worked! We are free. That was close. If he had gotten the second surround, I would have either lost my hero or had to use my town portal and I would not have it available anymore. This was one of the many very exciting micro moments where he's trying to get all his units to wrap themselves around me and I'm trying to do the exact opposite. Prevent him from wrapping around so that I can be free just like I want to be. I've partied hard enough on his side of the map. We're gonna go home. We're gonna summon skeletons from the corpses that naturally appear around my graveyard. The reason I went for a graveyard, by the way, is because they are. It is a prerequisite for uh, creating cryptians, and that's the unit that I like to make in this matchup. I'm now starting to do my first creeps of the map, of the game. Three cryptians is a nice amount to start creeping. I started with three ghouls and I teched to tier 2. The moment I hit tier 2, the Halls of the Dead, I immediately went on to tier 3. I'm now 40% of the way there already. Tier 3 unlocks one of the most powerful power spikes in the game for anyone. For undead that is. The, when you are on tier 1, the basic tree, the necropolis, you can have only one hero. But when you go to tier 2, you can train a second hero. We are going to create Lich, the inspiration for the Heroes of the Storm hero, Kel'Thuzad. Soon, in a minute, we'll have a second hero and we'll have more different abilities to choose from in fights. Or use them all. How to creep is an art in and of itself. If you look at the minimap at the bottom left, you see green circles, you see orange circles and red circles. Green generally means easy. Orange means medium to slightly hard. And red means extremely difficult. Depending on your army size, you will pick an itinerary, a route among these circles to choose how you're gonna creep. And generally when a game starts, you can only creep green camps. After your army grows to about three units, you could probably tackle an orange camp as well. And when you've got 12 units or more, you could probably tackle a red camp. Though it does of course matter how you do it. If you enjoy single player games, like Dark Souls or whatever, you will be familiar with the joy that there is in uh, trying to get better at beating the AI, at beating creep AI. And, and so it is in Warcraft 3 as well. Although you're technically fighting your opponent, I need a bit of <coughs> water. Although you're technically fighting your opponent, you're also always finding ways to creep most efficiently, which means taking the least possible damage while dealing the most possible damage to them. You want to creep fast and be healthy while you do it. I took a lot of damage while creeping and so when he came in he saw a chance to exacerbate that damage with a carrion swarm, one of his abilities. I took a lot of damage so I used coil to heal my own units and ran away. I'm going to stand in my base for a while. Undead units get bonus regeneration when they're standing on the black ground, which is called Blight. My vengeance is yours. So if you look at the Crypt Fiend here, 436, 37, 38, 40, not 
bad, not bad healing. In a minute I should be fully healed. Generally it's not a good idea to stand still for long periods of time, because there's always something you could be doing on the map. But we are hurt and we are waiting for one of our most advanced units in our entire arsenal. The Frostworm. It is created from the Boneyard and it has many prerequisites. You need a sacrificial pit and you need to be on tier 3. And then it costs 7 food. It is the single most expensive unit in the game. 385 gold, 120 lumber, 7 food, even more than a hero. However, it's a flying heavy assault creature and it slows enemies. We are making two frost worms at a time and we've also made use of our sacrificial pit by taking an acolyte from our black citadel, we trained a new one, and we moved it to the pit. It was sacrificed and it became a shade. I shall be your eyes. What needs revealing? I shall be your eyes. I am but a shadow of my former self. It's funny because he's a shade. What I do in death echoes in eternity. Death is its own reward. I'm having a mid-death crisis. I ain't got nobody. He doesn't have a body because he's just a shade. I'm invisible, gaseous, and deadly. What needs he's not actually invincible. So you can use the shade. The shade is uh, invisible. So opponents can't see him unless they have true sight. And he himself has true sight, so he can spot invisibles. We're going to use it to see where the opponent may be. We can also send it to gold mines to see if they have an expansion. This particular player does. So we're going to take our very strong frost worms and we're going to go attack. We can't maintain this situation where he has a second base and I do not. So I have to attack or maybe I will fall behind and his army will be too big. I right click the spirit tower to try and take it down. The towers are starting to hit my death knight. Uh oh, his acolytes are repairing the tower. Let's kill the acolytes first with a frost nova from my lich. It deals area of effect damage more to the primary target and slows as well. All right, we've made the acolytes run away. Let's kill the tower again. And let's use death coil to heal our frost worm who is starting to take a lot of damage. And we're gonna use our shade to check around here. I'm holding shift and then, then I'm giving multiple commands. You see the rally points, the flags? I'm gonna use a potion of invulnerability to keep my death knight safe. When you hold down shift, you can give multiple commands. For example, I right click this cool, then I hold down shift and then this and then this and then this one and then this one. And it's gonna do all that in a row. Of course you can give new commands. I'm gonna use Scroll of the Beast. Bonus damage for all my units for 45 seconds. Frost Nova on the Dreadlord. He's running away and we take down the Dreadlord. He even did a Carrion Swarm. Panicked as he was running away in the wrong direction. We just finished upgrading Freezing Breath. Frost Worms can now lock down enemy buildings. This prevents them from shooting back. It's a very powerful ability. My Lich just leveled up and I went for Frost Nova level 2 and Dark Ritual, which is a, an ability to instantly kill one of my own units, but I gain mana for it. When I'm in a pinch and I need a Frost Nova instantly, I may just sacrifice a Kripfian to increase my mana total. He's remaking the Dreadlord he lost from this altar, but because of my Freezing Breath ability, I can lock down his altar. His production is effectively frozen now. And what's more, he can't even cancel it even if he wanted to. Besides retraining your hero that dies from an altar, you can also repurchase them from the tavern. Just like in Dota, you have buyback. Buyback brings back your hero with half-life, no mana, and it costs far more than it is to revive them from the regular altar. It's actually pretty funny if you put a single frostworm on the altar, you know why? Not only can the altar not bring them back, but he can't even cancel the hero that he's remaking from it. 
So even if he wanted to pay the extra premium to revive it from the tavern, he wouldn't be able to because it's still in production in the altar with no cancel possibilities. So he would first yeah. need to deal with the lich and then he could deal with trying to remake the dreadlord from somewhere else again. A question from C Dub in the chat is do you also regenerate on enemy blight? Yes. Blight is blight, whoever made it. Mass Frostworms is very powerful in team play. It's not as common in one on one. But it suited the occasion well for me to explain you the game here. GG, we won. And as you can see, all buildings are not destroyed, but he knows it's over, so he taps out. First win. And GG well played. Now, let's drink some water. I need it. Any questions so far? And then I'll show a different race. <laughs> what is flex seal? <laughs> Don't worry about flex seal. It's a lot of damage. That's all you need to know. All right. Huh? <laughs> all right. Nice. Hey, good job, Heroes Hearth. I like the sound effect. Uh, Darth Bane, thank you for the bits. How do you strike a balance? Question by Hololol. How do you strike a balance between investment in early army versus investment in tech tree? That's a good question. Uh, so very roughly your first barracks should make uh, a total amount of units between three to eight. Three to eight archers, three to eight footmen, three to eight grunts. The, the more costly they are, maybe the fewer, you wanna invest maybe, uh, maybe about eight to, to 14 food in early units. And then you're going to develop other units as well. Is it a good choice to create necromancers with spamming skeletons? It's a very powerful tactic, but it comes online really late. So during that time, it may be tough for you to be on the map. If you meet someone and there's a creep camp and you want it and he wants it and you're working on necromancers, but he's got like all these riflemen. You're not ready yet, so you give the creep camp to him, and that is what is called map control. He has control of the map, because he invested in early units. Necromancers are one of the most powerful units in the game, but we virtually never see them in pro play, because they take so long to come online. However, you're not a pro. No one here is. Maybe one person. So. I actually think Necros are really great. I play them on ladder myself. Now, of course, I was a pro for seven years and I didn't play on dead and I certainly didn't play any Necromancers. And I never faced Necromancers either. But they did get a few buffs in a recent patch last year. And ladder is ladder. Tournaments are tournaments, but ladder is ladder. And I'm finding actually when I play on dead these days, they're really good. And people don't know how to counter them sometimes because they don't really face it often. The sword with the question, is it best to build a couple of all possible units from a race? Or should you have a balanced army? Two to three units mixed between melee ranged casters. Orc generally mixes a lot. Night Elf spams more. Human does a good amount of mix as well, but also more spamage. And Undead also mixes. Yeah. Generally, you do mix. Uh, it is rare to go 12 units of one type. You'll have two of this, five of that, three of that. It's more common. However, the more different units you make, the more difficult it gets to control them. So do mind that. If you're not ready to control six different units, you can keep it simpler for yourself. 
Great Boss Lusu says, what is cheese in Warcraft 3? When a player... Is it when a player from the Netherlands has an original strategy? <laughs> Damn it, man. Cheese is actually kind of uncommon. Uh, Genome said, you claimed earlier to strategically place your early orc burrows. What strategy... What strategy were you referring to? Well, orc burrows have a range of 700. If they are in a group and they can defend each other, that makes them stronger. But if they are all by themselves and they can't defend each other, then any opponent will ever be fighting only one at the same time, which is much easier for them. So grouping them is good, but you also want coverage to defend various parts of your base. You don't want to lose your barracks and your shop for free because there was no burrow near that could help defend. Your grunts were there, your hero was there. A burrow would have been lovely, but it was out of range. So some planning and how you build your city is quite important. <laughs> Are there any heroes that should generally be avoided? Not per se, but I do want to talk about what heroes are good at what and what heroes are not good at something else. So let's go into another replay and we'll do a brief explanation of why certain races are good. For example, in this human versus undead game. So here I am playing human on the account called Who's Day. Oops, lol. Okay, so uh, someone asked about heroes, right? Are there any heroes that are totally bad? Now, some heroes, they have effects that are called auras. And if you have an aura effect, it affects everyone in their range. So think about it like this. Night Elf has a hero called Priestess of the Moon. It gives bonus damage to all ranged units nearby her. How good is that if you have no ranged units? It's pretty bad. How good is it if you have only one ranged unit? Still pretty bad. It's an aura that equally affects all ranged units. If you have 100, it affects 100 units, which is really good. If you have one, it only affects one. So probably a hero that has this effect, Priestess of the Moon, is better when you already have a bigger army. When you start a game, you have no army yet. So probably Priestess of the Moon is not the first good hero because you don't have use for True Shield Aura yet. So you would sooner go something else. A Slipknot Ek said, I see many times the Blade Master is invisible and rushing towards the enemy base. It's scary. Uh, it's scary. What can an undead play? Oh, uh, it's scary and sometimes this works yep sometimes it does it depends on the control uh, twitch user says how do you prevent enemies from sniping your acolytes night elf has wisps in the mine orcs have burrows the alliance has militia what can an undead player do great question let's open a replay and look at what undead player can do against that okay uh for example in this replay we see pro player night end. No, different one. Hold on. I need a different replay. Uh, see, I need to be orc. And I need to be against an undead. Here. Damn it. Why you don't make a better ba ba base layout? Uh, how do I know what suits my playstyle? Someone asked. Well, you can try out different races and different strats and see what feels good. How do you handle handle orc versus orc and the opponent skipping grunts to go quick wind riders? Actually, uh, they skipped barracks, right? And you didn't. So you can either rush, but this may prove difficult. But there's many other ways to get ahead in Warcraft 3 as well. If you've got grunts and they don't, then what can you do that they can't? You can creep. You've got grunts. You can creep quite fast, so you have higher hero level. So that's one thing you can do, get a high hero level. 
Uh, and then make sure that you are quick to react if they attack you with wyverns. There's one more thing you must do. Don't lose your shot. Go for bestiaries and make bat riders. Bat riders destroy wyverns, wind riders. But you need the shop in order to build them. They're going to be targeting your shop to uh, make it difficult for you to make bats. But that's the key. Survive long enough and get bat riders. Sobek says, when I'm starting the game as a newbie, would you recommend playing the campaign? I would. Right now, that is one of the best ways to get into Warcraft 3. Play the campaign. There's a lot of really cool campaigns. You get to play and familiarize yourself with all the different races. And most of all, it's really fun. The storylines, the gameplay, many different types of uh, missions. And you see basically the story of how it all began before World of Warcraft. I want to answer the base layout question. Someone said he has trouble with orcs going for his acolytes. Take a look at this player, FS Payne. He has built his ziggurat as follows. This ziggurat is touching this graveyard with a corner. And this ziggurat is almost linked with the other ziggurat. Not quite, but almost. This is big enough for an acolyte to walk through, but it's not big enough for any hero to walk through. If he builds one more ziggurat here, that's what is called a full wall off. Now, Blademaster cannot walk in. So that's how undeads protect themselves from early harass. You can also upgrade a ziggurat to Nerubian Tower to slow enemy attackers, and that can help defend a lot as well. Another thing you should do is if there's a Blademaster at home, go home immediately. Use your death coil to save acolytes. Also, start walking your acolytes instantly and try to get them to safe spaces. For example, if this acolyte walks here and then goes through this corner, you have a quick route. They need to go from chasing the acolyte all the way around. Then you can just go through here again and they need to walk all the way around. During that time, you're healing, regenerating and buying time. So that's how you can try to keep them healthy. A co really cool question by the Swool, the Swoot, sorry. I'm gonna launch another game and then I will answer the Swoot's game simultaneously as well. The Swoot says, how do I know what race is right for me? And what are the different peculiarities or specialties of each race? Well, we're gonna go play a game of Night Elf now on the ladder. How do you know which one is right for you? As I said, there's four different races. And they all have their own specialities. Let's see. None of this is 100% confirmed. However, it feels a little like this right now. Night Elf will typically creep a lot and intersperse it with light harassment on the enemy. Generally, they try to take an expansion relatively early, defend it, and then simply outmask the opponent. Just have a lot of stuff. That's how Night Elves try to win their game. The reason they're good at creeping and simultaneously harassing is because of the existence of Moon Wells. Moon Wells can heal up units that are hurt. However, if you don't use them because you don't lose any dam you don't get any damage from your units, well then you're underutilizing an aspect of the race. You want to get damage so that you can use your Moon Wells. It makes sense that for this reason, Night Elf is the skirmishing race, harassing and moving around quick on their feet. I'm going to open with an altar of elders, starting with a hero. Undead is generally the one that tries to be efficient. Death Knight is their starting hero, often, more often than not. It allows them to regenerate and heal very rapidly. Uh, and also move rapidly. Undead has a lot of ways to heal themselves. For this reason, they tend to start fights, heal their own units, kill something and then run. Or maybe they'll keep fighting, but they'll keep healing their own stuff. And they try to be really efficient. Undead is the least economical race in the game. By that I mean, they take new expansions the least frequently among all races. But they make up for it 
in sheer fighting spirit and tenacity. Orcs? Orcs. Orcs are the race probably with the strongest natural heroes. If you like heroes, you're gonna like Orc. Their units are slightly less strong, but their heroes more than make up for it. Uh, typically, an Orc's game plan will be to creep a lot, to survive attacks, and then when they're ready and their heroes come online, they try to finish the game. They have a few tricks up their sleeve to buy time, including fake attacks, running away with speed scroll, and so on and so forth. Humans. Humans. Well, their racial identity changed recently. They used to be the one that expands the most often. But nowadays, human has all kinds of different playstyles. They can expand, they can go for big all-ins. What makes human special is that they can immediately attack uh, they can immediately attack sorry what makes humans special is that they can uh, use multiple workers to build a single building thank you for subscribing Darth Bane they can use multiple workers to uh, build one building this gives them a great amount of flexibility it is actually comparable to StarCraft II's Chrono Boost system. Chrono Boost breaks the rules of timings, and human power building does as well. Therefore, whatever human does, they tend to do so. One moment, please. Yeah, I think my dog ate some grass, and this is the result of it. I will be back in one minute. Good boy, Logan. Let me pick that up. He's being taken care of now. All right. Um, yes. Where was I? Thank you so much. Sorry. Go. Yeah, whatever human does, they tend to do so very extremely. And that's what sets human apart. So we've pretty much talked about all the different races. Now let's talk about this game. I'm going to be using my hero to harass and disrupt him a little bit. I've got a ability called Mana Burn. It burns mana. Use it. Don't take too much damage. And then we're just gonna hang around and be annoying. In the meantime, Oh, hi Kagiri, how's it going? Ready to learn some Warcraft 3 here? Trying to teach how the game works. So he started a creep camp which is orange. But remember what I said about creep camps? You're ready for an orange creep camp, generally, when you've got at least three to five units. He only has one, so it was actually a little bit too difficult for him. Look, my demon hunter is hurt. I'm gonna go home and I'm producing units from two Ancients of War. Huntresses from both. I haven't discussed my build as much because I was discussing something else. But you saw what I was doing roughly. We are now going to kill a stink bug. There's a lot going on here. I can never get used to the multitasking. Right. Yeah, multitasking is definitely difficult. That's why I'm keeping these games kind of simple. I'm now going to right click on the moon wells to heal my demon hunter. And I'm going to show you a cheese. We take all of our units and four wisps. We are going up to the maximum of our current food capacity. 
Huntresses cost three food. We have no more space for more. We're gonna sell our town portal, giving 175 gold. There's no way back now. We are what is called all in. And now we cannot make any huntresses anymore. Look. Create more moon wells, but we are not going to. We have a surplus gold now, but we are actually going to build defensive towers called ancient protectors in his base. Hotkey B to create building, P to choose a protector. BP, 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 BP. BP, four towers. Now all we need to do is to buy one minute of time. If we can use our army, lose it, not lose it, kill everything he has, it doesn't matter. So long as we buy time, mana burn, and we fight. We will buy time for these APs to come up and they're gonna help the fight. So I'm gonna press A, attack, and I'm gonna click to the left of his base. All my units will engage with his units now. And when I lose units, I can go back and create new ones. Looks like our towers are gonna be coming up. This is the equivalent of a tower rush in StarCraft 2. But you can't just send towers, you must send units and heroes as well. They're almost finishing. Tower rush complete. And let me show you a surround, a really cool micro trick for the more advanced. He can't go anywhere anymore. What you do is you move quickly around someone and then you press uh, try to make units at a constant rate we get so overwhelmed with all of the things we could be doing like creeping and attacking but sometimes we just forget to make stuff a bit of scouting is all good and well but we just need more units keeper in particular relies on units to get into the game more archers we're gonna uproot our tree uh, our trees here our ancient protectors this is a unique racial trait for night elf it can be good but you need good position good position needs scouting so you can get ready if you don't want to scout make mass hunts like i did lol yes just keep practicing He's a paid actor. People aren't this nice. How much did you pay him, Ian? <laughs> GG. Oh, I should have told him to, to, to come to this channel. Damn it, I missed a sellout opportunity. We actually haven't talked about hotkeys or groupings that much yet, have we? It would it would actually be a good opportunity. Let's take a look at this game and I'll talk to you about control groups. So actually control groups are very important. I do it, I play with it without explaining because there's so much to talk about. But here's what I was actually doing. I go to my tree of life and I press control four. Tree of life can now be summoned into my control selection by pressing four. It's control group four. I put my altar in control group five. So if I want something for my tree, I press four and then I start interacting with it. I press five and I start interacting with my altar. My hero and most of my basic units, I put it on control group one. Control group two will be my secondary set of units. Maybe one is all my melee and two is all my ranged. Three could be all of my magic using units. And with three control groups for units, I'm complete generally. That should usually be enough.
Your building is so if I want to go somewhere on the map, I press one, go, two, go, three, go. And now my whole army will move there. Then I want to build wisps. I press four and then I press W for wisp. Then I go to my altar, five. Then my hunter's hole, control six, six. Hunter's hole, you can do upgrades. So the, this is really useful. Start learning it early. Get used to it and it can make you faster. I could be attacking his base right here and be like, hey, I need huntresses. So I press my Ancient of War and then I make huntresses. 3H or 4H. Yeah. Makes it a lot easier and faster. Or for example, I'm sending my demon hunter to go creep here. Control group 1, go here. And I take a wisp, control group 2. And I go scout him. I'm creeping here and suddenly I hear your forces are under attack. It's my wisp. I press spacebar. It goes to the most recent transmission. Whatever last happened, spacebar. And when you press spacebar again, it goes to the second most recent transmission. If you keep pressing spacebar, you are pretty much shown every corner of the map where something happened. So if your hero gets attacked, and soon it will, Okay, our warriors have engaged the enemy. The building complete. Warriors engaged. And so on. My hero was attacked here. Soon my hero will get attacked again. But if it doesn't give here space and it goes to my demon hunter because he got attacked. So it cycles through all these transmissions. So and anytime something happens, you're like, oh, 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 what? Space. And you'll probably go there. Pretty helpful. There was something else I wanted to tell. Your building is complete. I forgot. Yep, I forgot. Oh yeah, of course. If you move somewhere with right click, you go and you ignore all enemy attacks. But if you move somewhere with attack click, you will move there until you meet an enemy and you will automatically fight. Using the correct one is important. Sometimes you want to make haste and go home, so you press right click. But if you want to make haste, go home, but make an exception if you meet enemies and fight, then you go with attack click. So it's important to choose the correct one. When do you upgrade your base and why? It really depends on your game plan. I like you to try and think of reverse engineering your build. Let's make a build order together right now. Someone from chat will say what he wants and I will make the build order. In a game against the computer, so that it is an easily controllable scenario. Go ahead, make some suggestions, don't be afraid. Co come with something like, win as quickly as possible, or make the biggest army possible, or uh, have something, have a very fast moving army or focus on creeping. There can be all kinds of different game plans and we will then reverse engineer our build order. Not the units that we make, but the goal we're trying to achieve. So a lot of suggestions here, some of them not amazing, but many of them cool. I'm trying to pick. So someone said, for instance, tier one mass, early overwhelming. So let's say if that was our plan, we would come up with a way to change the standard meta build into something that works better for that. So let's say, for instance, the standard is five peons on gold and seven on lumber. We ask ourselves, why seven on lumber? Well, we need lumber for our tier two tech and our raiders and kodos and wyverns. But wait a minute, Floss Twice Daily just said tier one mass. So we're not going to tier two. We're not getting tier two buildings. So why do we need seven workers? Okay, let's try it out. 
So we are actually going to send all five to gold, which maximizes our gold income. For this build, we are not doing any creeping. We're not going to tier two. We're just making the biggest possible army. That's the purpose of this build. And we're taking this goal to show you how we create build orders. I'm saying I'm going to not creep and I'm not going to go tier two. What is the best I can do within that space? So I'm optimizing guild mining instantly. Instead of delaying full gold mining to get my quickest hero out, I'm not interested in a quick hero because I want a big tier one mass. I'm making my burrow just on time to facilitate the next peon in line. You will see that by the time my 11th peon is ready to be built, this burrow will finish. How do I know that? Well, I just know. How do you know that? Try it once. Ready to work. So if your goal was a big tier one army, you would make constantly, uh, you would constantly make peons, and then you'll see, oh, I'm supply blocked. I need my burrow earlier. Then you just build it at the time you need it. We're now going to make our altar. So uh, the war mill takes slightly longer than the barracks. That's why we make it first, because we want to make head hunters. Head hunters require a war mill. So we go early war mill and then barracks. We are then going to make a second barracks for more head hunters. The first head hunter costs 20 lumber. So we're going to make sure that we have 20 lumber by the time the barracks finishes. And there we go. First head hunter is underway. The next money needs to go to a burrow because I need a lot of lumber. I need a lot of uh, food for units. So we're going to make a burrow now. And so simply with the purpose of making a big army, we have created a build order. Now I can do this because I know this build order or can understand how it works together. But if you don't, you can always trial and error and have some fun uh, against the computer. If you had given me a different goal, I would have done a different build order. But all of these build orders get created at some point, not just because it's fun to make buildings, but because you have a goal. We are slightly supply blocked, but there's no way around it when you make double barracks and a war mill. So as soon as the burrow finishes, we can continue head hunter production. And by the time the Tauren Chieftain comes out, we will have four head hunters. We can then either choose to creep or we could choose to uh, attack immediately. So we've started another burrow. And now it's also time to be critical. Did we need as many peons as we have? Right now it looks like we have a lumber surplus. So maybe the answer is no. But then again, in order to make the build order flow, we did need them earlier on. So we've got these peons that are no longer useful anymore. We have more than enough lumber and we said we're not gonna creep. So the only sensible thing to do is to bring our peons in a fight. We are going all in. We're not creeping, we're not teching. So if we're making this army and we see we have a lot of lumber, well, we have to fight with the workers then, or they will literally be useless. And if you're going all in with 95%, you're doing it wrong. If you call it an all in, go all in with 100%. Now peons, they're not very strong, but having a few of them is still better than having nothing at all. They deal damage, they soak up damage, they block. So that's how you could make a build. And I've never done this before. I've never attacked with four peons, but because I'm explaining it to you, it actually becomes more and more logical to myself that if I were to do uh, a head into a peon attack, that's more sensible than not using peons. So for instance, I could use head hunters to shoot and then uh, peons to surround and block grunts so that he can't get away. See? I'll try! Or maybe I see, hey, which one is the real blade master? The left one? All right, let's surround him. Let's try to use the peons to surround him. Oh, 
Yeah, or, or, or like surround this head center or whatever. Like you try, it doesn't matter. So that's something that you could do. And then like, if you keep trying the build order and you're satisfied with it, okay, I like this. I'm gonna try it out on ladder, for instance. Just an idea, right? And it can be like that for everything. For, for instance, your game plan could be have the highest possible hero levels as quickly as possible from creeping. And then you come up with a way where creeping is very effective. So the reason I'm explaining this is because someone asked, when do you tech? When do you tech? When do you upgrade your main base to tech? Well, whenever you want to. Uh, whenever you think it's good to uh, tech to tier 2 with the goals that you have. So if you don't like to make only grunts and headhunters, tech so that you can make other stuff but don't just tech if you're gonna tech fast make sure that when it finishes you've got something to do with it if you tech and your tech finishes and you're not using it you might as well not have teched you could just take an expansion instead or make more units does that make sense like i'm not talking about mistakes you tech fast you forgot to use it because you made a mistake that's different but if you really have no plan with your tech, then you didn't need to do it. Grubby, I just started getting back into Warcraft 3. Could you explain how to do surrounds? Sure, I'd love to. Now, when you're playing against computer in single player, you can use cheat codes to help you achieve certain army sizes quicker. Warp 10 makes you build buildings very quickly. Synergy removes the requirement of... Uh, you know, removes tech requirements. And greed is good with the number, gives you a lot of resources. I will be done. So say for instance, we want to surround this abomination with the following ghouls. This abomination, we want to surround it with these ghouls. So there's two ways to do it. If you have a lot of ghouls, you can just right click, move over him and then attack him. You press stop when you're around him and you attack. That's a surround. A bomb cannot get away. But rarely are we blessed with that many over units. Say for instance, we have only six ghouls. Note how ghouls move. First of all, can I explain that you should press this button? Every player that starts Warcraft 3 will have this button in a pyramid shape. I should have explained this first before anything else. This is called formations. You don't want to use it. No one wants to use it for any reason. It's like keyboard turning in World of Warcraft. <laughs> it's like playing Counter-Strike on a Sega. You don't want to use formation. Let me explain you first why. I've got one ghoul on the left, and I've got one ghoul on the right. And I've got one abomination here, right? This is an abomination. He wants to kill my ghouls. He will walk here and then kill the ghouls. Okay? The ghouls want to get away. Where do I move? Multiple choice question, chat. North, south, east or west north is incorrect south okay so we're gonna click south here how do you think the units will behave will they walk in a diagonal line for example if i take one goal and i click here he will walk diagonally down. He will listen exactly where I click. I click south, he goes south. That's how I want my unit to behave. When I have two units in a the group, they are expected to make a formation first. I need a different unit, sorry. Let's make a crit fiend. It needs to be different units, okay? When I move the crit fiend down, he goes down. When these units move down together, 
Note the speed of the ghouls, first of all. Now, for instance, let's say I want to get away from the Abom. The Abom wants to kill the Kryphian. And the Kryphian wants to get away. This is his movement speed. This is the ghoul's movement speed. The Abom wants to kill the Fiend. I move down. Damn it, why is it not working? <laughs> okay, look, did you see that? Kryphian stands still when turning. Stand still, why? Because he's going in formation. I move down. Kryphian waits, turns. You ghouls go first. And then I go. While this looks cool and means you always have your melee in front, if it was my utmost goal to get away from this abomination, I just failed. Did you see that? Make your choice. I need to get away from the abom. Let's first turn. So that's a problem. And that's why you should have formations off. Because if you have formations off, units will always respond instantly and leave when you need to leave. Formations create unpredictable unit movement that may seem like they're lagging and staying behind. So please do me a favor, do yourself a favor, always have this off. Now, let's talk about surrounds. Someone asked about surrounds. I want to surround this Abom. There's two ways to do it. I can move First of all, surrounds in Warcraft, they do not work dia diagonally. The album is free to leave, even when I squeeze diagonally around him. Maybe if this ghoul is slightly closer. No. Diagonal surrounds for the loose. However, north, east, south, west surrounds. are much better. So understand this about Warcraft. The key to surrounds is north, east, south, west, not diagonal. That's tip number one. Secondly, there's two ways to surround. I can pin him in place and quickly do this. Move everything around him roughly. Like uh, I can aim one ghoul here and one here and one here and one here that's a surround but it takes kind of long and mostly people won't be standing still for it so generally how you try to surround especially a moving target is by spamming the move command now move command is on the hotkey m if i right click once on the crypt all the ghouls will go to it right if i right click once on this crypt end. The ghouls will go to it, but they stay at a respectful distance, you see? This is called the follow command. Right clicking on one of your own units has the other units follow. Sorry, I need to deal with the opponent again. Luckily I have a cheat on that instantly blows up his units. So the follow command is pretty cool. You right click and they follow it. But note the distance that they follow at. If I want them to get closer, I must give another right click command. And then another. And another. And another. And another. And now they're as close as they can be. So generally, you will need a number of right click commands to get nearer to an opponent or yourself. So this is the key to a good surround that opponents cannot break free from. Now, you cannot aggro your own units, or at least you won't do so automatically. You can if you want. But it won't happen automatically. However, a right click on an enemy unit is aggro. You don't want to aggro them while surrounding. Your goal isn't to get damage in, but to create a prison they cannot break free from. So your goal is to use M. Right click is attack on enemy, follow on an ally. But M is always follow. Always move without fighting. That's why we use the M key. You can rebind this using the custom keys text file. In Reforged it will be easier. So the way to surround is to loosely wrap around someone and then spam M key. 
So all I'm doing is I'm taking a loose formation, walking past the crypt fiend, and then M, M spam. Now you see that there's a gap to the left. The crypt fiend is free to leave. So as soon as you finish your spam click, you make a minor fix like that. Done. Now crypt fiend is surrounded. Now let's try it on a moving target. Abomination will walk here and then to the left. My goal is to surround him while he goes to the left. Done. Once you're done, you press hold and it's done. So that's how you surround. Just spam M click. Surrounding ghouls is much more difficult. They're small and move at the same speed. So you need to block, 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 and block. And he got out. Because it's not easy. But keep practicing. Got him. So you can do this on enemy units, enemy heroes, and so on. And some of these micro moves are what make pro games the most interesting as well. Thank you for the follow, McBreezy. You can, of course, also stun or sleep an enemy unit, and then you can uh, surround them more easily. So that was uh, surrounding. So. We have taught you about economy management. We have taught you about upkeep, the four different races, roughly what makes each one stronger, some of their vulnerabilities, that you can make up to one to three heroes, that it's good to level them up, that you intersperse creeping, harassing, defending, and attacking, how to win the game, that you should learn build orders to make sure you have a plan, that scouting is good, how hero abilities work, agility strength and primary attributes. We've taught you a lot, but there's always more to learn. Just the other day, a viewer with the name of Bogdanov taught me, it was yesterday actually, for the first time that I know, even though I should know everything about Warcraft 3 because I was a tournament player for seven years. He taught me that Abomination's heavy armor that takes double damage from magic. It's not counted when he has an anti-magic shell, which is a banshee spell that blocks up to 600 spell damage when that interaction is happening and the magic damage gets blocked by the anti-magic shell. The abomination's armor type is not currently considered and griffins do 100% damage instead of 200% damage. So anti-magic shell is temporarily hiding his armor type making it better than you would assume because normally griffins blow up abominations he just taught me that yesterday now i haven't tested it yet but i have learned one thing twitch chat is always right i learned that from him and i've learned so many things about warcraft 3 that because of twitch i never thought was would be possible to learn more but there were so many things so whatever i've taught you here in this very humble one hour 45 minutes there's so much more to learn now, if you start playing on the ladder immediately, having never played Warcraft 3 before, you'll find it's fairly challenging. But if you start with the campaign and you learn what all the heroes and units do, you'll have one step ahead already. You can practice builds against the computer to get more familiar with them. Practice your control groups, your hotkeys. And if you are able to beat computer easy after finishing the campaign, good job to you already. Although it's called easy, it won't actually be that easy for a new player. Computer normal will actually do a pretty good job of focusing your hero and trying to kill it. So by beating computer normal is generally done not by attacking right away like I did in some of my games today, but creeping. Creep to your heart's content. Try to get a level 3 hero, get some protective items, heal potion or whatever. Maybe even get a second hero and some tier 2 units. And then you could fight him and maybe win. After you beat computer normal, there'll be computer insane. And then the ladder. Don't be discouraged if you lose your first one or even first 10 games. There was one guy in my chat 
he lost the first 16 games and then he finally equalized to 25-25. Matchmaking isn't perfect, but it's better than in Heroes of the Storm. And even though you will lose your first few games, it will start to match you with other worse players as well. Newer players uh, or, or just uh, not, not as good. It will get easier for you. It will get easier for you. And uh, you can always learn from the replays of the opponents that you played against as well. So every loss is actually a resource and a learning opportunity also. If you ever have any questions, come over here during a fight night or to one of my streams. You can always ask questions. There's uh, a lot of people that are very happy to help you learn the game. There's also some cool Discord servers. There's my Discord server. You can find it on my channel, exclamation mark Discord, on twitch.tv slash follow Grubby. You can go to the Heroes Hearth Discord as well, uh, which you can probably find very easily also. Uh, I will put an invite in the chat now. There we go. That's the Heroes Hearth this Discord, and it has been deleted by a mod. But luckily, Darth Bane <laughs> linked it for me. Thank you. Uh, yes. So there's uh, there, there will be many people that will be willing to help you learn Warcraft 3. Hope you enjoyed tonight's crash course. Most of all, I invite you very warmly to join us for Warcraft 3's Fight Night this Friday at 2 a.m. We're going to be having Hunter versus Insuperable. 2 a.m. Europe time. Uh, Pacific, 5 p.m. West Coast, USA, 5 p.m. This Friday. See you then. We're going to commentate a show match, a best of five, and it's going to be really cool. We'll see some of the best players from the North American and South American continents. Good night, everyone. Thanks for watching, and see you next time. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you watch till the end, great job. You're ready to start learning Warcraft 3. And please consider subscribing and ring that bell to see any notifications of the Heroes Hearth YouTube channel. Thank you and grubby out. Good night.